if you find no joy in life, there's a very low probability that you're pursuing a goal that you regard intrinsically, like in the depths of your temperament, as worthwhile. So, well, then you want to find a goal that regulates your negative emotion and that brings you a certain amount of positive emotion and that expands your competence as you pursue it. And you will experience that as meaningful. You know, let's say I, I was dealing with a client and maybe that was somebody who, say a man, 35 years old, he still lived at home. Um, so he was too dependent. His room is a complete bloody catastrophe. And, you know, he's living like a bratty 13 year old. And, that gets pretty ugly by the time you're 35. You know, and he knew it, and I'm sure his mother knew it, although obviously she put up with it, which was probably her mistake, at least in part. But maybe we decide, well, you know, let's start by cleaning your room. And so as a cognitive behavioral psychologist, you engage in a process called collaborative empiricism. And that's partly to solve the problem that you described as well, how do we know we set the right goal? Well, I'd say, well, go try it. And just watch yourself like you don't know who you are and come back next week and we'll see how you did. And maybe, I remember this one client, he came back and he said, you know, I went and got the vacuum cleaner from the closet, which is something I really never done. And I, I put that vacuum cleaner in the doorway of my bedroom crossways. So it blocked the doorway. And then I just walked over it for a whole week. Well, that was too high a goal for him. And you say, well, how do you know that? It's like, well, he didn't do it, did he? So then what you do practically is you say, well, how about you bring that vacuum cleaner into your room this week and that's your whole assignment? You know, you pick a target that you think is probably reasonable and you can negotiate that with yourself. And what, what I would do often practically with my clients is I would say, well, we're going to, your life is not going very well and that's why you're here. I mean, that wasn't a pronouncement on my part. And I would ask them, you know, what, what problems they were suffering from, what, what they were suffering from. But I would usually do a, I would say a pragmatic analysis of the generic quality of their life. And it's not that hard to do. You can do this for yourself. It's part of this self-authoring program that I have online. Um, well, I'm miserable and I'm anxious and I'm bitter and I'm angry and I'm stuck in my career and I don't seem to be able to get anywhere and God damn it, life isn't worth living anyways and so half the time I'm suicidal. It's like, okay, okay, you know, right? Now we've established the problem domain, right? At least somewhat. And then I would say, well, in, hypothetically, you'd rather that some of that wasn't the case, right? So because we want to establish a goal, what is it you want? More misery or less misery? And usually by the time people had come to therapy, unless they were mandated to do so, which never works, by the way, they wanted things to be better. That's why they were there. And then we'd just walk through their life. It's like, okay, well, let's do a, an assessment. Do you have any friends? And how often do you see them? Well, I have six friends, but I only see them once every six months, you know, one of them every six months. Well, you know, that's pretty low on the friendship hierarchy. So I just file that away as, as a piece of evidence. Do you have an intimate relationship? Are you as educated as your intelligence would indicate might be useful? Um, do you have a job? Do you have a career or failing that a job? Right? Because generally people need at least a job and perhaps hopefully a career. How do you regulate your drug and alcohol use? Because that's a major pitfall for people. How do you use your leisure time? How do you take care of yourself mentally and physically? Now, that's not everything about life, right? But, but if you don't have any of that, well, we have a place to start then, you know, like maybe, maybe you should try to make one friend. So one of the things you do if you negotiate with yourself is you set a goal and then see if you move towards it. And if you don't, well, maybe it's the wrong goal. Maybe it's too large. Maybe it's too small for you, right? So now it's not engaging you. Maybe you didn't really want to pursue that goal and you're just deluding yourself. And, you know, it's helpful to have someone to talk those things over with. But I would say, if you're not doing what you want to do or what you think you should be doing, drop the presumption that you know who you are. 
and start to negotiate with yourself like you're a stranger who needs to be enticed forward. Because you don't know who you are, especially if you're not able to regulate your behavior, because that's evidence that you don't know who you are. Something is driving the ship. It's not you, or it's not the you you think you are. And that's often extremely humiliating to people because you may have to pick a goal that's so low, so lowly, right, that you embarrass yourself half to death by recognizing the necessity of you having to practice that. But the upside of that is that improvement, incremental improvement, scales exponentially. So even if you have to start somewhere really trivially, man, once you start, you can really scale up quickly. And so, you know, and with an exponential increase, which I think improvement is, the, the trajectory of improvement is characterized by a power law function. It doesn't really matter where you start if you're doubling. Look, I mean, think, you get 1% better a week. That's not that high a goal, right? Maybe you could get rid of 1% of your stupidity and malevolence a week, or maybe every two weeks. Because that compounds in three years, you are a completely different person. And it doesn't end there. So even if you're starting with, you know, the horrible mixed bag of catastrophes that you actually are, if you're, if you're diligent in your attempts to rectify your errors and to aim higher, man, and then, with regards to your goals, let's say you don't know what to do. Well, maybe you're high in openness, and so you're pulled in all sorts of directions, or maybe you're low in conscientiousness, or you're confused because you're anxious, or you haven't had any direction, you haven't had good mentoring, et cetera, et cetera. There's lots of reasons. Well, I would say, pick something, right? Pick something. Um, a nameable goal. And then try to implement it. And what'll happen is, you'll learn a lot by trying to implement it. And one of the things you might learn is what the, a, a slightly better goal might be. You know, because if you try something diligently and you succeed or you fail, um, you're going to learn from the, the effort expended in the detailed implementation of the goal. It's going to inform you. It'll also transform you physiologically. It, it does that at a very basic level, neuro, neurophysiological level you will be slightly different as a consequence of the attempt. And what that'll mean is that the next goal you pick will be a little more suited to you. And so it's this kind of pathway, right? It's like maybe the goal you should be attaining is here, but you don't know that because you're clueless. And so you aim there. Well, it's better than there. And it's not nothing. It's not cessation of movement. And you know, if, you, if you're supposed to go there and you go here, but you walk diligently towards it, you're a little closer once you get to here than you were here. And it's this oscillating self-corrective process that leads you to the final star. And you have to be willing to engage in erroneous experimentation to, to manage that, but it is a self-correcting process. And so one of the things I always talk to my clients about is, well, well let's try something. You know, and, and, and we'll reserve to ourselves the right to alter our trajectory. And then I would use as a corrective there, because you might say, well, how do you know when you're not just giving up, right? Instead of thinking maybe you need a different goal. And I would say, well, if you're really concerned about your proclivity for self-deception, you can enter into a contract with yourself that you won't replace any goal you've set with a goal that's easier. And so you can switch your goal, but it has to be a little harder so that you check yourself against that tendency to withdraw and avoid and be self-deceptive. That works like a charm, and if you do that with some degree of diligence, your goals will get better and more attainable, and you'll get happier too, because you don't experience happiness except in relationship to a goal, and that's really worth knowing.